Welcome, dear listeners, to So Very Wrong About Games. It is a board gaming podcast about board games. My name is Michael Walker, and I'm here with my good friend, Mark. How is Mark today? I'm well, Walker. How are you? I am fantastic. That was me asking you personally how you personally are doing. That's only because it's written there, and you have to say it. So, we are I going... There's nothing on the script here about <laughs> you saying that I, I don't... What, uh, oh. I wrote it there in crayon on your screen. That's why you were so mad at the beginning. It will wash off. Take it easy. All right. So first, we're going to talk about the games we played this week. We're going to talk about the news and why it does not matter. Then we will talk about our main review, which is Guards of Atlantis 2. Mark, what did you play this week? I played Xenoshift Onslaught. Xenoshift is the co-op sci-fi deck builder by Karen Philosophiles and Michael Chanel. Michael Chanel is a staff employee of Cool Money or Not, and I really like a lot of his work. And we've spoken very highly about Xenoshift over the years. We appear to be the only people who thoroughly enjoy it. I think it is one of the very finest co-op deck builders in existence, if for no other reason than it really leans into the co-op aspect. Any card you buy, any effect you trigger, as a rule, can go straight into your partner's hand, can affect your, your partner's tableau or their lane, as, as it were, because it's tower defensey. And and that is great. It's also great solitaire. And I was in the mood for a solo deck builder. And I had just come back from picking up my time machine stuff from the Cool Money or Not Time Machine Kickstarter. And so I finally had the couple of missing decks that I'd never acquired because I didn't back it the first time on Kickstarter. And so now I have a fully complete set and I feel more whole. I feel more certain in my being. And I played a game of Onslaught. I played with the Fiery Aliens, particularly because I think they only really work well solo. Uh, they don't scale very well as a rule because your fire mitigation strategies don't scale with the number of players. It's, it's one of those areas where it's not particularly well balanced for the number of players. And I thoroughly enjoyed my game of Xenoshift Onslaught. I just enjoy the accelerating dread of the aliens coming after you and playing with all these cool different troop types. And that's one of those areas where, like many a deck builder, more variety is all for the good because the different troop types add a significant difference of flavor. On top of that, you have your own division power and the different aliens have different special abilities and so forth. And I had a grand old time playing Xenoshift Onslaught. Now, it's been so long since I looked at that Pyromancy expansion now, did it not come not, with... Well, not a Pyromancers. The expansion came with two item cards, did it not? Like sort of like... Three. A, oh, three. And, did you, and is it something that you picked before the mission? Or do you get all three? Or how did that work again? I've forgotten. So the expansion's called Xenoshift Immolation. Immolation. And it introduces a heat mechanism, whereby the various aliens will trigger special powers based on how much heat is, uh, is ambiently in the area. Every time you kill a monster, one heat is added. It goes from zero to five. If you roll over, if you start generating sixth and, and heat and upwards, the base starts taking damage as a consequence. And that's why the game doesn't scale very well for multiple players, because the additional piece of equipment that is always available, it's not one of the slots of equipment. This is additional equipment off to the side. It's basically a tableau power that you can trigger and then refresh at the cost of one space buck, which they call Xenosathem. But... The most you can do when playing multiplayer is reset the track to zero. That's the most you can ever do. You can go into battle with the track at zero. If you are four players, each killing four monsters, well, that's 16 heat that's going to be generated over the course of the round. Now, as monsters trigger special abilities, they use heat, but that's a lot of heat, and there's not a whole lot you can do, do about it in the middle of the round. Con conversely, if you're only playing solo, four monsters, when you're starting at a track of zero, no problem. So even if the monsters generate more heat, or if you use items that generate more heat, it's, it's more manageable. That's basically why I say it doesn't scale super, super well for lots of players. But of course, as our most salient and frequent criticism of Xenoshift goes, why would you want to play Xenoshift with more than two players anyway? It really starts to drag precisely because it is an incredibly interactive co-op deck builder. Because as I say, every purchase you make, every effect you trigger can affect anybody. And so suddenly every small decision, if you want to micromanage everything, can become the opportunity for a great deal of discussion. And so we thoroughly enjoyed it too. We thoroughly enjoy it solo. I've played it three and four on occasion, and I probably wouldn't do it again. But I am very, very pleased to have a full set of Xenoship now. It is definitely in standard rotation for those rare occasions when I want solo deck building and or two players. And uh, especially since and we'll be talking about this later in the context of another game in a moment. One of the things that I really like about Xenoshift and was really audacious and is seldom mentioned and underappreciated is the extent to which they made an entire deck builder and they said, um, we don't want to deal with the economy. The economy runs itself. You don't buy money in Xenoshift. Money just escalates by itself. 
and it's super clever and it means that all you're doing is focusing on toys. And so there's never this conflict of, well, I mean, I probably should just buy more currency, but there are these cool items and eh, forget it. You know, that tension that you feel in too many bones where this core stats are so much stronger than the fun toys or when you're playing some sets of Dominion where really you want to buy money. Anyway. Xenoshift is a great game, underappreciated, I think. I think Michael Chanel is a great designer, and his work here with Karen Philosophiles is, is marvelous. There are two base sets, Onslaught or Dreadmire. Either one is a great entry point, although the rules from Dreadmire, I should stress, are the ones you ought to use. There are a couple subtle rule differences, but they really improve the overall experience. Xenoshift Onslaught. I think it's great because it's just so well-balanced, right? Almost every game is right down to the wire, you know, getting by on the skin of your teeth. Very challenging every time. Oh, it is very challenging. I don't know how I, I don't know how balanced it is. Sometimes you just get blown out. But the challenge I, I, I absolutely appreciate. Mark, I got to play Azul Queen's Garden. This is another game with the Azul name. The only thing that's the same is that there's you get to draft tiles. So since there was tile drafting, guess what? You get to slap Azul on the side. Is it designed by Michael Kiesling? It is. Well then at least it's not purely crass marketing. It's Michael Kiesling and put out by Next Move Games, and I think this is one of the hardest games to ever try to explain audibly. Because there are these tiles. There are these tiles. And you lost me. There are numbers one through six, and they're all depicted by pictures. So one tree or a bird for two wings or three butterflies. So they go one through six on the tiles, and there's six colors. So six colors, six different pictures, varied through this giant bag of tiles. This is important because you're going to use these tiles to buy stuff. It's mostly to put tiles out. In order to put tiles out, you have to pay a number of tiles equal to its value. And it has to have something to do with that tile. So they either have to be the same color or the same picture. Now, this is where it gets complicated, Mark. There is this rule of two. You can never use the exact same tile for that payment. So if I'm putting out a green butterfly in the payment cannot be a green butterfly. Mm. That also takes, that also is in fact, when you're drafting tiles, it is also the same rule as well. When you're drafting tiles and you say, okay, I want all butterflies or all pink or all purple, then you just cannot take two of the same exact same tile. How easy is it to get tripped up and forget about that? Quite a bit. Okay. It's pretty rough. I think everyone got over it halfway through the game. It's it, because it is, you know, sort of extra fit. I don't want to say fiddly because it's just, it's just like an extra rule that you have to keep watching. You know, you sometimes you get carried away. It's well, like, sometimes the, the simplest of games, little restrictions like that are the easiest to forget and run up against. That's why I ask. It's true. And you're also drafting at the same time. Like when you, when you start the drafting round, you're putting four tiles on top of the stack of, of map tiles that you're going to use to expand where you're allowed to put these tiles. And that's also a rule of two as well. When you're placing the tiles, you cannot have two of the exact same tile in the same sort of chain. So if I'm chaining purple or chaining butterflies, there can't be two of the same color. Or anyway, rule of two always applies. And so when, as soon as one of those tiles gets drafted, and it's, of course it's going to after the very first player, as soon as there's any tiles missing off that, you put it to the side, put four more on it. So eventually you're going to branch out with all these tiles, and as soon as one clears, you flip it over. And on that tile is an a, a already pre-printed space that has a color and a picture. All the same rules apply. Right. You draft it with, you know, all of the same color of some tiles, and when you want to play it, you got to pay for it the same way. So you're drafting tiles, and... The tiles that you draft, you pay other tiles to put them out onto other tiles. Exactly so. Got it. And then there's all sorts of scoring. There's an interesting wheel where all sorts of different colors and shapes will score in the four different rounds. And then there's final scoring and stuff. I, I, I really did like it. It's very puzzly. It gives you this catacho sort of feeling because you want to, you get extra scoring for getting these groups together, either groups of, you know, the pitchers or groups of the colors and. I'd play it again. It's hard to go wrong with a pretty puzzly tile layer, generally. Yep. Nice tactile feel. Nice pictures. Like I said, all the pictures depicted, you know, the number, so there wasn't this, you know, wondering how much all the tiles were worth. It was good. Zool, Queen's Garden. Played a game of Spirit Island. Now, I just want to stress something, Walker. I've said this before. I've said this a number of times, but I think it bears repeating. Every time I go online and I see people talk uh, talking about Spirit Island, the brilliant masterwork of Eric Royce, personal friend of mine... They always take the opportunity, sometimes egregiously, sometimes for no reason it's not salient at all, but they go out of their way to slam Shadows Flicker Like Flame. And this is completely unacceptable 
Shadows Flicker is hashtag best spirit. When I go home after this to edit this episode, I will be in my home office under the benevolent gaze of his of its fiery eyes and its shadowy tendrils. I say benevolent. I mean, I'm not really sure. It could be malevolent or disinterested. No one really understands what Shadows Flicker is thinking. And I, I mean, I say eyes. Maybe it sees. Maybe it doesn't see. It's hard to tell. Uh, no one really knows what Shadows Flicker does or why. But that's what makes it so awesome. Anyway, Shadows Flicker is the best spirit. I will brook no disagreement from anyone. And these people... These people, Walker, these people online, if they even deserve the title people, who constantly want to talk about how it's not worth playing a Shadows Flicker like, how dare they? Rude. How dare they? I had an excellent game of Spirit Island, and I played a Shadows Flicker like Flame, and now it's a, it's a point of pride, Walker. It's a point of allegiance. It's a point of principle, because favors are to be called due, and I respect those things. Shadows Flicker is absolutely the most content of all the spirits. Uh, if Shadows Flicker is a person, we're not really sure. If it's rational, we're not really sure. No one's really sure what it does. But the the point is the same. Hashtag best spirit. Spirit Island. The end. I don't know if I can play any of their spirits now. Now it's just a point. That's right. Anytime there's the option, I just have to... It, it, it's a point of principle now. You have to prove. But t- does does the that spirit actually need to be proven, Mark? Apparently it does. Apparently. Mark, I got to play a game that you wanted to try. It is called Dungeons and Dragons Dungeon Scrawlers. This is a real time drawing game. So you get these dry erase. Drawing is an exaggeration, but go on. It's a, it's a, uh, like a sort of a laminated sheets and there's, uh, plenty of different dungeons and every, they have enough sheets for four players. So everyone, four players get the same dungeon. They say you're supposed to play three in a row. We just did one. It was sort of a warm up game waiting for players to show up. And so what you have is this giant layout of a dungeon with rooms and traps and monsters and all the different dungeons are different. They have some sort of like little mini games as well and all sorts of different little variations. But this was the starter one. You simply go in and when you go into a room, you have to uh, associate yourself with all of them. You have to do something to every item in the room or else you don't get to score it. So magic, you're tracing things, rune stones, rune stones, you're making sure you're doing them in order. Monsters, you're making sure you color them all over. So you're quickly drawing around this map, this little maze thing. Yeah, you're literally scribbling in the map. That's right. You're using your dry erase marker and you're racing through the dungeon because whoever kills the main boss first, that everyone has to stop. And all the different dungeons have different end conditions. But this one is, as soon as the main boss is dead, then the thing is over. So you can do whatever strategy you like, just try to get more points other other ways or go right for the boss and try to get the big points. Everyone seemed to enjoy it. I'm looking forward to trying the, you know, the different variant maps because you can also give people player powers as well. You know, the typical, typical dwarf, elf, human, and they all have their own little ways that they interact with the map. All seems very interesting. It is Dungeons and Dragons, Dungeon Scrawlers. The way you described it to me was that it was a real time competitive connect the dots. I'm there for that. Yeah. So this is Dungeons and Dragons, Dungeon Scrawlers, designed by Evangelis Bagiartakis and Konstantinos Karagianis. On the to- topic of drawing, Walker, I hastened to stress that Dungeon Scrawlers wasn't actually drawing, it's just, you know, scribbling and scrawling. Because I played Telestrations. Now, I don't think I'd ever played Telestrations before. I was at a gathering, actually hosted by a friend of the show, Warm Boy. This wasn't because there were gamers present. This was more like what normies would do. <laughs> you know, non, non-hobbyist non gamers. And so we, we pulled out a copy of Telestrations. I was vaguely curious. You've sung Telestrations praises in the past. And Telestrations appears to be one of the favorite party games among hobby gamers. I don't really know why. To my mind, I, let, me, let me set these things out. To my mind, what differentiates a good party game from a merely functional party game is that a really good party game will be accessible and approachable to people with lots of different skill sets and or will be the kind of experience that will generate charismatic slash funny slash revealing moments regardless of people's willingness to go the extra mile on the, on the part of the game, right? Almost any party game can and will generate memorable moments if you surround yourself with charismatic people who are into the premise, right? But it is the exceptional party game that draws these experiences out reliably time after time after time across different groups of people. So one of the criticisms that I have, this this isn't necessarily uh, the best example of a party game per se, but if you look at a game like Spyfall, 
It is not very good at helping draw people out of their shell. If you're nervous about, quote unquote, making a mistake because it's kind of sort of a team game, then people are going to get very nervous about talking and it just gets very difficult to get those really interesting questions and answers that are really revealing. This is not to say that Spyfall is a bad game, and it's not to say that you're not going to have really memorable experiences with Spyfall. Similarly, if you want to play charades with a whole bunch of people who are not very good at improv, that might be a problem. If you want to play charades with people who are great at improv, it could be the best time of your life. Now, moving on to Telestrations. I hate drawing. I, I utterly loathe it. A game that I quite enjoyed in the party genre, and I'm I, I'm a little bit disappointed we didn't play more of it, was Starlink. Because what Starlink does, again, this is an example of what you can do as a party game. You can't draw freehand, you have to draw constellations. And there are a variety of spatial constraints that serve to give context and contours to what you're able to draw and how. And I thought that was really clever, and it also helped people who either have a shaky hand or just a bad artistic sense, or someone like me who has both. Returning back to Telestrations. Don't hate the don't hate the player, Mark. Oh, I hate the game as well. <laughs> no, the, the the saying is "Don't hate the player, hate the game," and that's exactly what I'm doing here. Telestrations is fine. I mean, whatever. But the problem is, again, if you hate drawing, and what you get is a situation where, yes, that will lead to more hilarity, right? But the game element of Telestrations, such as it is is best jettisoned, right? Because to play well at Telestration, Telestrations, for those who are not familiar, is basically telephone with drawings. You know, the old uh, school game of telephone, a broken telephone where you whisper something, but you can't ask for clarification. And so, you know, it's like, oh, I said banana, and it ended up in thermonuclear war. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Right, fine. But in Telestrations, if you play well, as an example in our round, someone pulled Flamethrower, and it's actually pretty easy to draw a flamethrower, it turns out. I know, because I had to draw one, and it was all right. You get points, not that we scored. We played without the scoring rules, which I think is the best way to do it. You get points by drawing the thing successfully, and then having someone else guess successfully that was the thing you drew, and so on and so forth. So this is not an entertaining thing. You get the entertaining hilarity when the game falls apart. Which is fine, you could have designed a game around that. But the game incentivizes you to not have things fall apart. Now, were there some funny characterizations? Uh, yes. The one I liked, and this was one that I contributed, was I was handed a drawing, and I sincerely believed that it was of the Michelin Man pulling the same party trick that Baldur the Beautiful usually did. Baldur the Beautiful, of course, from North, Norse mythology, has a party trick, literally had people shoot arrows at him because he was invulnerable. And I saw what I thought was the Michelin Man having the same thing done to him. I can't even remember what it started out as, but the drawing was intended to be Tesla coil armor. Anyway, setting all that aside... Telestrations is fine. I just don't think that it does a good job. You broke everyone's book, didn't you? Not everyone's book. I, I, I kept that flamethrower tight. <laughs> flamethrower worked fine. I, I, I maintained some of the links. I'm actually, look, I did a lot better than I thought I would in terms of the actual drawing. But the, the thing is, when it comes to party games, again, how much does it do, how, like, do the rule structures, such as they are, manage to enhance the experience or not? And in the case of Telestrations, I find that they don't, generally speaking. Is it apt to be a great time? Almost certainly. But it's not going to do anything to help people who are not particularly inclined to scribble, like myself. And nor is it the case that anyone who might have a thought, and I'm not saying these people are perverse, but it's reasonable when playing a game to say, oh, let's play to try to win. Let's let's try to play well. Good play in Telestrations is boring play. Those, I think, are two structural failures of a game of Telestrations, and thus there are party games that I would infinitely rather play. In terms of actual drawing, I've mentioned one Starlink, because again, the structure of the game serves to make it more approachable for more different groups of people. Of course, Starlink isn't trying to be funny. At any rate, that was my experience with Telestrations. I got to play Trickarian Legends of Illusion. Not tricks. Mark. Not Definitely not tricks. Illusions. Illusions, Michael. And we, we did a uh, review on this already. Self-proclaimed alpha gamer wanted to play it, so we did. And I enjoyed it just as much as I did back then. Uh, it's a game where you are uh, buying a bunch of materials to perform illusions. And then you perform these illusions at the theater and they give you money and fame. And these are what are victory points. And you improve your tricks and you go to the dark alley. Illusions, Michael. Illusions. Sorry, you improve your illusions. And you go to the dark alley and you improve your actions and you go and you buy more illusions and all. I enjoy it. I, li I like looking at the components at the very beginning of the game, seeing what's available, 
picking sort of my sort of illusion tree and saying, well, if I get these particular things, that sort of leads to this one. And then my final one will be this. And then I press really hard to get, you know, right to the end because the better illusions are worth more victory points. Had a great time. Tricarian, it is uh, Mind Clash's first design. This is put out by Richard Amon and Victor Peter. And if you have a chance to play it, I definitely would. And this is a review copy we got from the publisher. On the topic of party games, we played a game called Psycho Killer. And with great effort, I will suppress any urge I have to make any reference to any songs. It's funny, Mark. I, I wiped it from my head. Yeah, so there's that. So Psycho Killer is a review copy we got from the designer. This is a take that game designed by Michael Wilkinson. And let me just give a, a sort of general thrust about what one does in Psycho Killer. You draw the top card of the deck and you hope it's not bad. Have I left anything major out? No. Yeah, I don't think I have. There's other action cards you can play that do various things, like reverse the order of play, or pass some cards from your hand to somebody else, or this, that, and the other, but at the end of the day, mostly you're just drawing a card from the top of the deck and hoping it's not bad. Now, it's themed around slasher movies, and I don't know that it does an especially good job. There was one moment that was kind of sort of vaguely evocative, uh, at one point, Huey drew a an eponymous psycho killer, and then he played the hide under the bed card. That kind of made sense. That's about it. I mean, <laughs> I'm trying to remember other things. Because, indeed, the central element of the game is that the psycho killer is pursuing the various players and dealing wounds to them, and your job is to be the last person left alive, the one with the fewest wounds. The way that wounds are doled out is largely through a bevy of weapons. And I'm not... It just seemed a little bit strange that what happens is the psycho killer shows up, and the theme, I guess, is that the psycho killer hurls a chainsaw at player one, two two baseball bats with nails in the player two, and a hatchet and a hook at player three. I guess that's kind of how horror movies might work, but I, again, I'm not deeply into the genre. So, uh, did it generate some laughs? Yes, mostly at the game's expense. You know, this, this was this was a Starship Samurai movement. We're not really aficionados of the take, take That genre. I think if you want to look at the Take That genre elevated, I would look at Doer the Lesser Houses by Jim Felly. That is how you do a Take That game for a hobbyist audience. But in terms of non-hobby experiences, you know, we love party games, we love bluffing games, we love dexterity games. There are lots and lots of lighter experiences that we would infinitely rather play than Psycho Killer. Uh, I don't. I think the least I say, the better. I just think it's ex much like that. It's like, do you want someone's first experience in modern board gaming to be this game or Exploding Kittens? Well, I don't even know that that's fair. I don't know that Psycho Killer is trying to be modern board gaming. I suppose. You know, it's basically the same level as, as Uno or something like that. It's, it's kind of like on the same level as a themed Uno. There are things you can do within the Uno category. There's Skip Bow, for example, which I actually think is kind of a, an okay experience. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, base Uno is not exactly what you would call a, 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 a heavy hobby experience or full of decision making. I would put Psycho Killers squarely in that level. So if you're going to be playing Uno with adults and you really like slasher movies, sure. But uh, that's a pretty narrow <laughs> frame. All right, that's Psycho Killer. Kiss Kiss I, Mark, I got to play a game called Welcome to the Moon, designed by Alex Alexis Allard and Benoit Turpin, published by Blue Cocker Games. This is a review copy given us to by Lion Rampant Games. And this is another uh, flip and write, much like their other Welcome To series, but this one is on dry erase boards, and it has sort of a campaign system. So, you oh know, my goodness, the the you know the first mission is you know you're trying to get the rocket filled up, and then the rocket blasts off, and all the different maps, much like you know the the D and D one I already talked about, has all sorts of different ways to play. The first one is very much an introduction to how the Welcome To sort of system works. You know, you flip three cards, pick one of them, and it doesn't, you know, each one had its own sort of row. You're just trying to fill the rocket ship and get points. The second one was very interesting. It had this very long snaking path, and the Welcome To cards usually go from 1 to 15, many more spaces than 1 through 15. So how are you going to put them in ascending order? Well, you see, once you pick certain lightning bolts, then you get to draw a line anywhere you want in that 
long snaking path and sort of start dividing it up into your sequences. Ah. So when you draw your first ones, you sort of have to, you know, space them out and, and think carefully how you're going to put your first numbers before you get, you know, enough lightning bolts to start dividing up your line. Had all sorts of interesting, and this was just the second map. I'm interested to see how much it, you know, advances and adds more stuff. So I'm definitely going to go back to it. I'm going to try to introduce it to Butterfly and see if she likes it. We will see. Welcome to the moon and let me play among the stars. I'll just do this one quickly. Speaking of Butterfly, I introduced her to... roll and write on Jupiter and Mars. I introduced her to Yak. In other words... Okay. (laughs) I introduced her to Yak. Mark, this the game that I picked up from Pretzel Games, designed by Michael Liu. Very charming, very cute, baby yak. How could she not love it? You're <laughs> you're sort of designing your pyramid, much like you know Queen's Garden, making sure the colors you know fit in nice patterns and very uh, basic scoring system, which will leave everyone almost with the same score at the end. Sure, very family oriented. Looks so amazing with the, with the carts and the giant blocks and, and interesting interactions that sort of make sense. You know, you pay food to get more blocks and, you know, the, bo- the carts populate. And anyway, still want to try Yak. I'm willing to play it one more time, I think. <laughs> you got one more left in you, huh? Yep. Okay. <laughs> well, then maybe I shouldn't take that away from the butterfly. We played Dice Realms. Dice Realms is the latest by Thomas Lehman. Thomas Lehman, he of many of the best tableau builders of the past 15 years, as well as a whole bunch of other genres that he dabbles in, such as 18xx. He's designed some of the very influential 18xx games in the past. And this is his take on a sort of dice builder. So there was a game called Rattle Bones, published by Rio Grande Games whereby you could alter the die faces of a given of given dice. It was an impressive feat of engineering, but Rattle Bones was not what you would call an interesting type of game. And Thomas Lehman has now d- decided to double down on that idea. And it's basically the way I would describe it as Dominion with dice. You roll your dice, that generates what you've got, that's kind of your hand, and much of the time what you're just trying to do is upgrade your die faces. And the upgrade system, I think, is just the right level of complex and clever. You can internalize it in five hot seconds, but allows you some really interesting options. There's this idea of upgrading along a given type, so you can take a given die face and just make it better, or you can change what type of die face it is in case you don't need it anymore or you didn't want it in the first case, in which case that has a certain cost associated with it, which is present, but not in any way onerous. And so you're not trapped by your previous decisions, nor are you compelled to just go along a set upgrade system. There's enough freedom, but not too much freedom such that you can just purchase anything whenever you want. And that I thought was really clever. Now, ideally, in normal circumstances, what you're supposed to do is play with some presets. Very much like Dominion or a deck builder, you have some preset special faces that are introduced at the start of the round. What's interesting is that you'll still be playing mostly with default faces, just in terms of sheer quantity. Unlike Dominion, where the vast majority are the are the special action cards that you cycle in and out, here the vast majority are the stock ones that you'll be playing with every game, and you have a much smaller number of custom ones that you'll be playing with. Walker, however, being the iconoclast that he is, no one can tell him what to do, certainly not Thomas Lehman. It is a version of the game. comes with this giant bag in order for you to put the tiles in, and they had to make it a giant bag because some of the tiles are double-sided. And because half a dozen of the 30 tiles are double-sided, well, then we have to include this giant bag in order to put all the tiles and in. you just didn't so want to use draw... the bag. No, I used the bag. You put all the tiles in the bag, and you draw out six. That's how you do it. Oh, because there was a bag, because yes. there was a component to allow for that mode, that is the mode you wanted to try rather than a recommended preset. Just so. Okay. All right, fine. Now, it's worth noting, I think, before we go on, go on into the gameplay, uh, it doesn't surprise me that there's a giant bag because there's already giant plastic trays, lots of big chunky dice, tons of little tools to remove the die faces, and, and an abundance, a plethora, as Michael Walker would say, of die faces. And I think that's appropriate given that the game retails for all of your money. How, yeah, much, how much do you I have? That's I, how much it costs. I think this is the one case we hardly ever talk about cost. Well, yeah. we usually mention it in passing when it's pretty, when it's when, pretty high. Well, that's what I'm saying. In this case, I think it is justified. Yeah. It is very expensive. Yes. But the dice are amazing. Oh, uh, yeah. 
we never had a die face fall off. We never had anyone having any trouble taking the die faces off. And it is quite a fury. Everyone rolls at the same time. Everyone does their own thing. It is very heads down. But yes. you're constantly updating. You're constantly, fl- you know, flicking off die phases. Never had any problems throughout the whole game. So that kind of engineering costs money, I think. Absolutely. You know where the money went. It is absolutely the kind of thing where you look at all those components, you look at the engineering, the the plastic tray that was designed specially for the game that has been molded to show the costs of upgrades. Very helpful, very useful, much appreciated. But I wonder, well, I'm very curious to play more. I'd like to try some of the presets, for example, because on a first play, I was sticking mostly with with the pre-established die faces, you know, again, the Dominion equivalent of big money which just to see how the basic system worked. And I, I, I didn't get a whole lot of mileage out of the special unique die faces with, with, with uh, different or custom effects. And I'd like to see whether there's some combos to be built. I'd like to see if there can be a little bit more, more reactive, both because I, I'm curious about his design work and I'm, I'm generally willing to defer to Tom Lehman's design work. I'm sure that there's some interesting stuff in there. I do, however, have two doubts. Number one, it is competing very much with a lot of other Tom Lehman designs. Very quick, that ramp up very quickly, and then suddenly the the game is over because somebody hit the victory point threshold far sooner than you thought it would. Relatively heads down with a tiny a tiny sliver of interaction. I mean, it made me feel an awful lot like I was playing Res Arcana, to be frank. And Res Arcana is full of more special effects and gives you more visual and effect variety at a much lower price point. And between the having to manipulate resource goes in, resource goes out, resource goes in, resource goes out, and the, quite frankly, rather considerable teardown of Dice Realms, I'm not sure which I'd prefer. Yeah. You, you spent a lot of time at the end of the game. Yeah, it's much like Dice Forge, if anyone's played that. Resetting all the dice back to their original, putting all the die phases away. As a proportion of our playtime, it was very high. It was. But the, and when you get back to the, I want to get back to the player interaction. There is, sure. There are a bunch of different combat dice I think, that will sort of amp up the player interaction, I think. Oh, sure. I, I wasn't criticizing the, the, the relatively low amount. Again, it reminded me a lot of Res Arcana. Just enough so that you couldn't plan your entire economy from turn one, and you had to pay a little bit of attention about what was happening around the rest of the table. Because that's exactly how the attack effects work in Res Arcana. Especially if your opponent has built heavily into them, you have to bank in some degree of uncertainty, lest you be caught with your pants down, figuratively speaking. Or literally, I don't know, the night's young. It's true. We'll see how it goes. That was Dice Realms by Thomas Lehman. Mark, I got to play Yokohama Roll and Write. This is designed also by Hadashi Hayashi and published by Akazu Brand. This is the same uh, publisher that put out Yokohama in the first place. And uh, Tasty Mental Games brought it to North America, and seeing as they're not around anymore, I do, I'm do. i not sure if this is even going to make it to the North American market. Uh, Yokohama Duel did not make it, so who knows? Well, so it, that- was, it was eventually sold to North Americans through the big sell-off by... Oh, uh, Renegade Games? Yes. Yes. It was available there, yes. So this definitely has the feel of Yokohama, even though it's just a roll and write. You're, the way you uh, gain employees, they sort of all have to be connected, like you are moving around Yokohama, you're getting uh, technologies, you are uh, fulfilling contracts and getting bonuses. I think they did a really fantastic job because everyone's doing stuff at the same time. It flows really fast because there are no turns whatsoever. Well, there's 12 turns of the game, but I mean, there's no one, there's never ever any one person doing something. You're always, everyone's doing everything at the same time. Therefore, it is extremely heads down, zero interaction because hmm. even the technology cards that are, that are out, everyone gets an opportunity. Like they stay out. They don't refresh. Everyone has a chance to get them. The game is was completely in Japanese, so there was a little bit of translation going on. But I'm definitely keeping this, definitely playing it more. There's two sides to every sheet. Uh, the contract board is completely different on the other side. And a few other things, so I'm looking forward to trying that out. And like I said, there's a whole deck of technologies that will change the whole game up as well. So I, I take it from your comments that your primary bit of enthusiasm that elevates this above the legions of other role and rights is primarily its similarity to a Euro game that you really adore. Just so. That, that's perfectly reasonable. That was not meant as a criticism. No, 
it's, yeah, it gives you that feel, and it's just something a little bit different. And that is Yokohama Roll and Write. Finally, we progressed a couple of games in our Stars of Akarios campaign. As per our previous outing, we played two games back to back. This is our first exposure to the other gameplay mode where you do planetary exploration, because as is well known, when you're part of a large military organization and you need to extract some resources on a potentially hostile environment, you send fighter pilots. This is just what you do. It's just, it's, it's the way of things. And we basically played a very, very, very small, constrained, stripped down game of Seventh Continent. And I'm kind of okay with that. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure yet whether these little episodes, these planetary engagements, will serve their intended purpose, namely to offer some degree of breaking up the possible repetition of endless combat scenarios, or if I'm just going to find them tedious. Well, on your comment about sending pilots, Mark, I would like to refer you back to Battlestar Galactica. Okay. You see, actors are very expensive to hire. Okay. So you're going to use the same cast for everything in your show. I see. Because hiring new people is more money. You sure. just reuse the same people for all of the parts. Well, it's funny you mention that because I actually, the, the, the start of the campaign, no spoilers, does set up a, a, a bit of a disaster, but they didn't go all the way. It would have made far more sense to have to send fighter pilots to go do these things if it were the case that we were more stranded, if we were cut off from available architecture, or it would also make more sense that we, the players, were making decisions about where to send this ship. It's like the captain, the navigator, the XO, the all the engineering staff, all the command staff at the bridge. They're like, so where do we go? And they turn to these random four pilots and like, uh... To the beach, baby! Uh, over there, it's like, as you say, you put the coordinates. So, I mean, that part just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And, and I mentioned that, that the planetary engagements might become tedious, primarily because they lean far, far more heavily into the writing. There's a lot of writing involved in every scenario, even the combat ones. Sometimes a full page. And the writing so far is uh, pretty disappointing. I'm not a huge fan. Characters introduced without context. There's a number of typos, which I will stress have been corrected in the errata form. I did happen to notice that some of the grammatical mistakes, weird punctuation, and strange cadence has been corrected in many instances. They are committed to resolving these problems, but you're sitting there with the book. I I don't know what it was like for you as players, but I'm sitting there and I'm reading page after page of this relatively uninspired and uninspiring prose, and that was not particularly pleasing. That wasn't too bad. I'm enjoying it so far because okay. the game is so good that it, it sort of just... Yeah, the game itself is amazing. The, the space combat is really excellent. My only criticism is it feels like sometimes there's not a whole lot you can do on a given turn. I would have probably expanded the scope. Now, it, obviously, you have to change a lot of things, but I would have liked to be able to do a little bit more on a given turn because when you're playing Gloomhaven, and as we've commented before, Stars of Akarios is very much Gloomhaven in space in a lot of ways. Gloomhaven, you're constantly activating different action cards. And even if at the end of the day, it mostly involves moving a certain number of spaces and hitting somebody for some amount of damage, they have different names and they do have different sub effects and they have different little contours and flavors that are involved. So you constantly feel like you're doing different things. In Stars of Akarios, you have a much smaller set of systems that you're activating on repeat, which makes me wish that turns felt a little bit more different or I could do a little bit more on a given turn. This is a mild critique though, because like you, I am thoroughly enjoying the space combat. Agreed. I'm just wondering, because they, they seem to be advancing us a lot quicker than you would in Gloomhaven. You're getting abilities much faster. Your your modifier deck is getting, you know, changed up. I'm just wondering if that that's going to come sooner rather than later. I don't know. It's a good question. I, I wonder also what's going to happen when we have the opportunity of trying different ships. If the new ships that we unlock... Unlike the classes in Gloomhaven, in theory, the classes in Gloomhaven are all equivalent in terms of power. I wonder if the new ships are just meant to be strictly better. I don't know. There's there's stuff to discover. I'm keen to discover it, and I am keen to play more combat scenarios. Suffice to say. And that is Stars of Akarios, designed by Brennan McCastell and Jonathan Twains. Put out by Oom. I think that's how you say it. And those are the games we played this week. Now, on to the news and why it really doesn't matter. So there's going to be new Spirit Island stuff. And again, it doesn't matter because you should really be playing with Shadows Flicker Like Flame, hashtag best spirit. But this is going to be crowdfunded like previous iterations. But unlike previous iterations, they are not going to Kickstarter. They're also not going to GameFound. They're going to be crowdfunding through BackerKit. BackerKit itself is now going to become a crowdfunding platform, which is interesting. More and more alternatives seem to be popping up. 
in no small part, some people have been very explicit about this, both in terms of the publishing angle and in terms of, of the pledge manager angle, precisely because Kickstarter remains stubbornly committed to moving to the blockchain for something, something reasons, something, something better user experience, something, something tech bros. Uh, and it really seemed, I, I haven't seen the numbers. It's a, it's a, they don't release public information like that, but I can't imagine it's going well for them. Now, maybe in, in terms of, of projects. Now, that may be not where their money is. If you get to sell yourself as a technology company rather than a platform as a service company, well, then you don't care necessarily how many people are using your service. You care about what an interest you're able to generate as a tech company. So I'm just a humble end user. But as an end user, I got to say, there's more and more reasons to go to the alternatives and fewer and fewer alternatives to, to resort to Kickstarter. This may even have eventual impact on Pledge of Indifference. So at the end of the day, uh, Spirit Island is just another example of future projects that will not be going back to Kickstarter in the future. Hashtag best spirit. Let's hope that their their user interface is a little bit better than GameFound. It can't be worse. <laughs> My piece of news is Galactic Renaissance. This is designed by Christian Martinez, and this is going to be a game put out by Madagot Games, and they usually put out very interesting, very good games, and, Christ, and Christian Martinez was the designer of Inish. Now, the Pieces of Inish are great. Inish as a whole, well, sometimes is very fragile. But nonetheless, I enjoyed my planes of Inish, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what this game has to offer. It is supposed to be the second in a planned political trilogy. So I'm, I'm, I too am very much looking forward to Galactic Renaissance. Christian Martinez is certainly a very interesting designer, and I do prefer science fiction, so we'll see what happens. And that is the news of the week and why it doesn't matter. Now to our main topic. Now to our main review, which feature, is... Feature, feature, feature game is the term that we've been using for five years. If you just want to change it for no reason, uh, go ahead. Oi, 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 oi. Maybe if... You want to change the name of the podcast? Do no. you want to change your name? Do you what want to change want my name? is to get some sleep. All right. <laughs> now <laughs> on to the feature game of the week, which is Guards of Atlantis 2. Guards of Atlantis 2 was published this year after successful crowdfunding by Artem Nichipurov of Wolf Designer. Artem Nichipurov is the designer of 2017's Guards of Atlantis, coincidentally enough, 2019's Warpgate, and 2021's Trickshot. Artem Nichipurov is actually one of the designers that I point to when I see talking heads, especially online, talk about how, oh, you know, contemporary design is all just recycled, rehashed, and without any inspiration or any novelty. Artem Nichipurov designs have all been very different from each other, and they've all been thoroughly excellent. And he is absolutely one of the group of new designers like David Thompson that I can point to and, and say that the hobby sphere still has tons and tons of interesting people doing interesting things. And that's on top of people like Jim Felly, who don't fit into any category whatsoever. He's just sui generis. Just Jim Felly. At any rate. Jim Felly is Jim Felly. Jim Felly is absolutely Jim Felly. But Artem Nichiporov is Artem Nichiporov, and I have loved every one of his published designs. And why don't you give us an unhelpful summary of what one does in Guards of Atlantis 2? What you do in Guards of Atlantis 2 is you pick your character, you set up the minions, you place your character, you grab your five cards, three level one cards, two permanent cards. You take one of these cards that have a boot on it. You put it face down in the number one slot. <laughs> Boom. You're you're halfway into your first games of Guard of, Guards of Atlantis 2. It's just that easy. <laughs> I mean, you're not exactly wrong. <laughs> So it's a MOBA-style game. We've talked about that before. We've talked about the various things that you can emphasize as a MOBA-style game. And the thing that Guards of Atlantis 2, very much like its predecessor Guards of Atlantis, emphasizes a lot is the interplay between farming and PvP. You're not going to be jungling. You're not going to be doing last hits or anything like that. You're not going to be managing minion waves and other groups. Basically, you're given this sandbox of minion combat effects and PvP player effects, and you have to strike a careful balance because you can lose in either way. Uh, because you your team has suffered too many kills or because you haven't managed the farming properly. And of course, there are follow-on effects in terms of the economy of the game, etc. Cetera, et cetera. We'll get into some of these details later. But uh, I have I played a lot of MOBA-style games in the past, and Guards of Atlantis 2 is a, definitely my favorite of them thus far. Yeah, it's much more than just a second edition of Guards of Atlantis. It's definitely completely updated. They took everything that was fun and 
cut out all the chaff, all the unnecessary stuff, boiled it down to what was necessary, and they just streamlined the whole thing, and they did a great job. Like a, a simple example would be, and make no mistake, we loved Guards of Atlantis. I, I Guards of Atlantis made it into the swag canon. It was one of our favorite team games. I think it's my favorite team play strategic game of all time, supplanted only by Guards of Atlantis 2. And in Guards of Atlantis, you still had your five cards, but one of the card was just a hold card. Everyone had it. And so you would have to play it and essentially lose a turn if you had been attacked over the course of the round. Unsuccessfully, mind you. If you had been attacked successfully, you were dead and you were on cooldown. Another thing that Guards of Atlantis 2 dispenses with. But, you know, it's, it, it, it seems like a relatively simple thing on paper, but in practice it was very difficult. Ar- 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 Artem Nitsaporov looked at it and said, well, why don't I give everybody an extra special ability? Why don't I just further customize the players and replace the hold card with something that synergizes with their inherent strategies and or background? And thereby give people more options about what to do on their turn. And there you go. And suddenly, instead of playing the same four cards every round, sometimes playing the useless one, you now have further options, further texture, further differentiation, and further ways to try to manipulate the battlefield to your favor. Yeah, and there are tons of different heroes. And unlike Simon, which will just tweak the numbers slightly. Absolutely. Each character plays completely different. Some of the characters have tokens that you put out. Some of the characters play with their decks differently. The key part that we've already talked about of Guards of Atlantis 2 is that you always only have five cards in your hand, and you're always going to play four of these cards. So it leads to this very intricate interaction with the other players, where timing is the main part of the game. You have your initiative. You, If you want to, you can play Guards of Atlantis 2 many different ways. You can play your own way. One of the main ways to play, I feel, is to know what your opponents are playing, Knowing when their initiatives are happening, anticipating what cards they're going to play, sort of try to counter what they're going to do, make sure you're in position and they can't get away, and make sure you're allowed to do what you want to do. I've said this before, there's a very, very high skill ceiling that you can encounter in Guards of Atlantis. It's just, it's effectively a dizzying pool of bits of information and different interactions that you can potentially encounter. And the extent to which you want to internalize these details and or retain them is very much up to you. And I would encourage you, if you ever want to feel like an idiot, to play a game of Guards of Atlantis 2 while the people from the Discord are there, because they will absolutely chime in with every single thing you do and talk about how this is the reverse Sicilian backdoor defense or something or other, because they've seen it all. Uh, (laughs) Now, there's... As a consequence, there's a very, very large and active online community that plays on Tabletopia all the time. But then again, they have to play on Tabletopia, so more's the pity. But there are certain heuristics. There's certain ways to onboard your experience in Guards of Atlantis 2. And again, this is one of the other benefits as compared to the first Guards of Atlantis. The incredibly large roster of heroes is divided up into three different levels of complexity. And oh my goodness, is there a significant difference in complexity between a complexity one hero and a complexity three hero. Furthermore, there are certain very, very simple heuristics you can get. For example, every character's gold card is going to be their fastest card, with some very narrow exceptions. People's red card is their most powerful attack, but it's not going to be as fast as the gold, which is going to be faster but less powerful. So you're able to generate these kinds of ideas while you're looking about whether you want to play your red card or your gold card, and if you know that you want to either be faster or slower than your opponent. You don't necessarily have to remember from previous rounds, oh, my opponent's red card is at initiative 8, and therefore I know exactly the number that I have to beat, which dovetails to a broader topic that I'd like to get into later, but it nonetheless means that you can put into it more or less as much as you want. I'm agreeing with that because it's not necessarily that the three-star characters are more powerful. I think they're just more complex for a reason to make the people that want that complexity have to do these things. Like they have to shoot in a straight line. Right. They're a little... Good example. They're a little more you know, glass cannon either a little more thing and they have to make sure they stay away. They have to know the values of the other players. They need to, you know, interact with everything. And that's because that's the people that want that interaction know to take the level three characters. Right. Guards of Atlantis 2 is a no luck game. But it has simultaneous action selection. Now, some people regard that as effectively being luck. You can regard it as basically a simultaneous blind bid if you're concerned about it in terms of initiative by itself. But through this incredibly simple structure, you get all these complicated decisions. And and the the trick is, it's... (laughs) Because I'd like to segue into, into one of the important caveats with respect to Guards of Atlantis 2. Because like many 
iconoclastic bits of game design, it is not for everybody. And I find it somewhat daunting, generally speaking, to review Guards of Atlantis and Guards of Atlantis 2, because the idiosyncrasies and the peculiarities of the game that make it not for everybody are very easy to articulate and point to. The genius of the design and the incredible tense, accessible, and dynamic aspect of the gameplay, I find more difficult to verbalize. True, I have that line for that. It's like the first time you play, these are things you're going to hear. No, you can't do that. Yeah. No, that doesn't work that way. No, read the card again. No, read the whole card. Yes. These are all things you're going to hear on your first plane of Guards of Atlantis. It is absolutely not going to be an easy experience for people with low frustration thresholds because there are a number of different ways to approach a situation in Guards of Atlantis because your your card doesn't work because someone moved out of range too quickly because the initiative was too low or you misunderstood how the card effect worked or you got killed before the thing could actually happen or they keep you keep chasing them but the radius doesn't work quite right or or or, yeah, or you had or. this grand plan but you had to use all your cards to defend exactly, yourself exactly exactly and some people react to those situations they this is fascinating I want to get better at this system so I can start working these levers to my advantage. Other people get turned off. I've been in a number of matches where I was worried about people getting turned off precisely because I've been, I, I played the game half a dozen times before, but, uh, and this was their first game. As again, there's a very, very high skill ceiling. It's much easier for someone who's played the game a number of times before, especially if they're playing a character they know to completely scupper and counter the plans of somebody who's just fumbling around. And it's, it's a little bit awkward and, and, Again, people who appreciate that kind of learning experience or appreciate being exposed to a game with this amount of depth will react much, much better and will probably desperately want to seek that second playing as opposed to people like, I wanted to do the cool thing on round three and I wasn't able to do the cool thing, therefore the game's not for me. I respect that position, but I think they're going to be missing out on something truly special. Yeah, and it's one of these games where you... We've talked about many skirmish games or card battling games that have a map element where the map element does not matter. Right. This is not the case in Guards of Atlantis. A single space could mean everything. That and just the way the the pushing works and the the placement of the minions and and the fast travel. There's just so much to the map presence of this game that it, I don't think it would be playable. You know what I mean? It's a main yeah. part of the you game. You couldn't you couldn't abstract it away and you wouldn't no. want to. And Ultimately, I think that dovetails with the math of what's going on. We've talked a little bit about initiative values, but the same thing is true of attack and defense values. The math is so carefully calibrated that a single number difference makes a significant difference much of the time. Not always. There's some characters who are so incredibly powerful in their attack that if they're able to pull it off, some people will never be able to defend. That's that's true. It's just it's just the nature of the thing. If you've built, if you've when you've spec'd up, if you've completely ignored defensive bonuses. And you're against somebody who's maxed out on attack? Sure. But very, very often, I would have been able to defend that attack if I was standing next to some of my more friendly minions. I would have been able to defend that attack if I had been specced up on defense just one more time. I would have been able to avoid that attack if I'd specced up on initiative one more time, and I would have been able to get away in time. And that, I think, is really a tribute to how carefully tuned the cast has become over the course of these process of iterations, such that even, again, on your first, second, third plane, you start noticing these the, the incredibly influential effects of subtle numeric differences. Let's get back to that specking, because it's sort of, they call it items in the rule book. And how this works is when you, when you kill minions or kill other heroes, you are going to get some money. And when the round is over, you can use this money to level up. And when you level up, there's two cards to choose from. And the card you don't choose becomes an item. And that gives you plus one attack, plus one defense, plus one initiative. It all depends on what you, on the card you choose and you slide it in. And that makes every game, even with just that one character, completely different. And you can, Change it up however you like every game. Love it. Every level up decision I've had over the course of Guards of Atlantis 2 has been situationally decided by the dynamic elements that are leading up to that leveling up. So if I know that there has been a player who's been harassing me, generally speaking, and I mean that in the best possible way, like they're they're trying to go for player kills. I I know I need more mobility. I know I need more defense. Or maybe I need to kill them first. And so it's not just the car, this picking the same card every game because you think the card is cooler. It's there's the universe of abilities, true, but sometimes that little icon at the bottom of the card is the most consequential element, and that's the thing you need to trade off. Yeah, or I really want this ability. It is 
it is awesome, but the person that attacked me all the time has a seven attack. My one defense card is a six. So yes. I'm sorry, I can't take the ability I want. I'm going to take that plus one defense. So now I can defend against him. Not, not to say that the two, the choices are very even. It's just, it, it changes the gameplay. It's just, it's, you know, it's right. Not, it's just more yeah. texture and contours yeah, to the It's not so much that, you know, my, now I'm weaker because I have to pick the other card. It's just that I'm just going to have to play more, play differently. Right. As opposed to lots of other games of this ilk where you level up. And even if you still enjoy it, but you still find yourself taking the same abilities time after time after time because the game state is not as dynamic. I mean, there are very few games with the game states as dynamic of Guards of Atlantis too because it's, purely a function of of the choices that players have made in this no luck system what they want to focus on how they've been specking how they've been pl- uh, using their limited resources how your teammate is backing you up or not all of these things what, matter what a character tremendous- what characters they choose absolutely yeah. absolutely so i'd like to talk a little bit about some of the overt design decisions that our team is part of has put in the rulebook that i fully endorse but rub some people the wrong way no line of sight Yes, that's one of them. People get confused because in the first Guards of Atlantis, he just didn't talk about line of sight and you would get all these rules questions. So how does line of sight work? Which thing was, well, there's no mention of it in the rules. So there's no such thing. If you're in range, you're in range and that's it. He was a little more explicit in the second edition rulebook precisely in response to those questions. Uh, but some people just find it difficult to believe. It's like, but that that's an impassable space. I, how yeah. can I see? Because you can. Because you can. The team communication rules. The rules are that you can say whatever you want to your partner, so long as the other team can hear you, but the moment cards get revealed, you're not supposed to kibbutz at all. You're not supposed to get any advice. Should I move over here? Should I move over there? Should I kill this minion, that minion? And this was explicitly put in. I mean, obviously, look, when you have a game, you can house rule whenever you want. You can turn Guards of Atlantis 2 into Tiddlywinks if you you wanted to. But the idea here, again, is that the design was meant to produce a certain kind of experience. And that experience was, in this particular case... No information that is hidden from the other team in that way, but a certain degree of uncertainty whereby you have to make your own decisions once you've actually time to resolve the card. It also, obviously, helps speed up play considerably. It's hard to remember. We backslide all the time because it's just natural in a team-based game to just try to get input from your partner so you don't feel like you're leaving them out. But I would encourage people who are skeptical to really lean into these restrictions. I think you're going to find the experience at least interestingly different, if not outright superior, as I do. One thing that people might have trouble with as well is that you either block all the damage or you just die. Yes. That's another thing about the, the the frustration threshold. You have to accept that you might just die a lot. But if you're the kind of player, and again, normally I'm not that guy. Normally I have a very, very low uh, frustration threshold. But in a game of Guards of Atlantis, I'd be like, yep, yep, I see what I did now. <laughs> that was on me. Yeah, okay. And then you're back in the action in a couple turns. That's another excellent change between one and two. <coughs> Bless you. Go ahead. Do you have any more about that particular point? No. Uh... Damn it. Well, I have another big controversial thing. Yes, go ahead. The other thing, which is proving to be very, very controversial, and I think there's a much bigger topic about this. I think I'm going to expand on this on bloat sometime in the near future, is Archim Nichapurov has designed a game, and I'm paraphrasing here, but I don't think he'd object to this characterization, where he wants people to make mistakes, or at least he expects people to make mistakes. Some people can't deal with that. Some people want to know the entire information system, but the rules of the game stipulate you're not supposed to ask your opponent questions like, what's your highest initiative card again? Some people will then go crazy and say, well, that's hidden trackable information. I should take notes about all these things. I don't want to lose, or I don't want to fail an attack, or I don't want to miss an ability because I made a mistake like that. Archim Nichapurov wants you to fail because you made a mistake like that. That's the game he designed. That's the experience he wants to craft. And I, for one, like it that way. Again, very controversial. And he's he stated it very bluntly online. It's like, this is a game where it, and mistakes lead to interesting game states. Heavily calculational, precise play isn't necessarily the best way to play a game. It's definitely the slowest way to play. It's also the slowest, right. Because everything in this game is designed to flow quickly. Yes. Everyone chooses a card face down. You flip it up. You take action initiative order. Next one, you do four. You move on. Minions push, the games gets played very quickly. Yes, absolutely. And again, 
Some people only feel satisfied at the end of a game if they look back and they can say confidently that they made absolutely no mistakes and their play was somehow textbook perfect. I am not that kind of player, and I don't like games that are designed towards that kind of experience. I love the fact that at the end of every game of Guards of Atlantis, all the players at the table can point and say, yep, I made a mistake there, made a mistake there, that cost me this, that cost me that. I, You won because of you, the clever thing you did and the stupid thing that I did, or at least not stupid, but the mistake that I made. That, I think, is interesting game state, and it p- shows in the play of the game. I don't find it as satisfying when at the end of a game of Tricarion, everyone's like, oh, I calculated the cost and everything perfectly. I was efficient. You were just marginally more efficient than I was. Not not to bag on Tracarion, but there are a lot of people who like if if there are if, if if I lose because of a mistake, that's a waste of time and the game is bad. It's like eh, I don't I don't feel it that way. Neither does Artem Nichaporov, and I think Guards of Atlantis Two is a great test case of why that's so. I agree. I do want to go back to where we talked about when you reveal cards and they say, "Oh, I didn't realize you were going to play that card, and now your whole thing is ruined." But it's not so much that. It's a little bit like Gloomhaven, like when you reveal your two cards and someone kills the monster you're going to kill, you still have options on your card. There's still, you know, a, there's movement and other things you can do with that card right. other than you, it's your choice. One of the things you learn, one of the skills you can acquire is to set yourself up into a position where you try to pull off the combo, you try to execute the ability, you try to do the double think. But if it doesn't pan out, you have backup options. Yeah, that's what, that's how I usually play is I, I line up a hero and a minion at the same time. It's like, oh, well, exactly. if, if that hero moves out of the way, then I just go over and... And and paste this poor minion instead. Right, because the game where you very convincingly won the game for your team, you were playing Brogan the Barbarian. Brogan's most powerful attack obliges him to move in a straight line a certain number of spaces. And so in other games, more permissive games, less restrictive games, it would be up to that many spaces. In Guards of Landis 2, you have to move exactly that many spaces. And so that means if you need to go the wrong way, you're going to go the wrong way. <laughs> but you very cleverly, as you said, set position up where it's like, well, I'd love to go cave in the skull of this hero, but if they move out the way, at least I can go over there and kill this minion instead. Same thing with the sniper who has range restrictions. Some characters are more restrictive than others. Again, that leads to the difficulty levels power versus flexibility and all those other lovely bits of texture that you can explore in a game of Guards of Atlantis. I mean, I should mention one of the other big restrictions and stumbling blocks for a lot of players with Guards of Atlantis. The player count is very restrictive, especially for your early games. For your early games, it is four or six players. That is it. If you have a little bit more experience with the game, then you can start experimenting with some of the novel ways to expand the game to eight or even ten players. You can also start experimenting with uneven teams, but uneven teams is uh, re- it, it's a t- tricky situation because your first impulse is to say, well, we need to make sure that all the experienced players are on the minority team so they can figure things out, or the majority team because the majority team has these weird handicaps. But you can never put all the experienced players of Guards of Atlantis on the same team. That is a recipe for disaster and having newbies get pasted. So then the, the response is, if you have five players who want to play Guards of Atlantis, the only thing you can do is basically have that fifth player wait until everyone's at the same skill level, and then you can start messing around with it. So it's very, very restrictive in that sense. Agreed. Yeah, no, I've, I've done everything. All right. We talk a lot about approachable games. I absolutely value approachable games. Guards of Lens 2 is not approachable. It is easy to play. It's easy to pick up. It's easy to see lots of cool stuff. But there are lots of barriers to entry that we've talked about dispositionally and in terms of player count, in terms of lots of other things. But it is so rewarding as a modern hobby game and just leads to more dynamic emergent situations than I see in other games of its ilk by a considerable margin. I absolutely adore Guards of Atlantis 2. Anytime I have the requisite player count and or people willing to play, it is absolutely something that I am going to push. Yeah, a lot of games uh, have come out since the first Guards of Atlantis, but none do it as well as this game. 100%. This is an absolute triumph, I think, in terms of not just core game design, but in terms of how to refine an already epic-making design into something that is truly polished and truly a marvelous experience. I cannot recommend Guards of Atlantis too highly enough if all the caveats we've identified do not strike you as deal-breakers. Even if they do, you might want to give it a try. It might surprise you. Find someone that has a copy, give it a whirl. 
That's going to do it for this week. Thank you very, very much for joining us for So Very Wrong About Games. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can find all our contact information at sowronggames.com slash contact. We read everything you send us, and we'll get back to you if we can. We hope to see you again soon, and thank you for spending some time with us. Peace! You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Biggin. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time. And always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong.